All right, I would like to introduce Lisa Brown, who is our first speaker today. Uh, she's a game designer in the industry for over a decade, working both in AAA at Insomniac and Bungie, and as an indie on games like Hyperlight Drifter. Very exciting. Uh, she loves gameplay systems and mentoring mid-career game designers, which means I should talk to you later. Uh, <laughs> but welcome so much, Lisa. It is fantastic to have you, and we'll be playing a video and uh, having time for questions after, so take it away. Greetings, friends. Welcome to Roguelike Celebration, and thank you for coming to my talk. Why do I even like roguelikes? An exploration of player motivation. My name is Lisa Brown, and I am a game designer. I have worked on many a game in my career, mostly action combat games, and I've played many a game in my life. I love all different sorts of games. Roguelikes, however, are a special love of mine and something I would consider a pretty recent love at that. In fact, I remember the first time I even heard the phrase roguelike. I'd always loved games, and I was a fledgling game designer at the time, so I was curious to learn more. So I asked around about what, what is this roguelike, what, is, what does that mean? And several of the different folks explained it to me in very similar ways. Here's what they said. They all said that a roguelike was a game that was really hard, where you failed all the time. One where you explored procedural and random dungeons, and most importantly, that there was permadeath, so if you died, you lost all your progress and had to start all over. And I remember listening to this at the time and thinking, wow, that sounds terrible. This definitely does not sound like a game for me. And so I wrote off roguelikes for years as something I just probably wouldn't like. I didn't try any. But fast forward to now, and it turns out I really, really like roguelikes. In fact, they're one of my favorite type of game. These three in particular, Nuclear Throne, Slay the Spire, and Loot Rascals, are three of my favorites. And they're the ones that got me, right? They, I put many hours into them. They kept me way up past my bedtime with a, oh, just one more run type of situation. And I love them a lot. So why did this dissonance happen? Why was there this, this opposite reaction when these games were described to me? And that's the goal of this talk. I want to answer several questions. First of all, why do I write like roguelikes likes if I was so put off by the description of them? And why are they so sticky for me? Like, it's not just that I enjoy them. There are ones that just like, they really grab me. Second, why do I like some roguelikes but not others? Why, for example, do I have hundreds of hours put into Nuclear Throne, but Enter the Gungeon just sort of bounced off of me? And then number three, is there a way I could have described these games better to help pass Lisa get a better understanding of the gameplay experience? Basically, this is all a very introspective journey on the player motivations of me specifically, but hopefully you'll all learn something along the way as well. So a while back on Twitter, I went and I asked roguelike players to tell me how they describe a roguelike to someone who had never heard the term before, so pass Lisa essentially. And I encourage them to describe it in their own words, uh, but I got a lot of similar things as, as those original descriptions. Uh, Run-based, having to try again and again. Randomness, uh, procedural generation came up a lot. Permadeath, or only having one chance. Uh, some people mentioned a limited carryover progression. And exploring the unknown came up a lot. And here's the thing. These descriptions of roguelikes were focusing on the mechanics and the features of the games themselves. But that wasn't enough for past Lisa. There was a dissonance there. So for this exploration, instead, I'm going to be looking at players. I want to understand the motivations of the players who like roguelikes and see if there's, there's something there that explains to me why I love these games so much. So let's talk about player motivation models real quick. Uh, I'm a professional game designer, so this is something that uh, comes up in my industry. These are basically ways of thinking about why players play games and what motivations are they fulfilling when they play games. There's lots of different models, but today I'm going to focus on the Quantic Foundry Gamer Motivation Model. I like this, it's very science-backed, and you know it's not perfect, but it does do a pretty good job of uh, defining player motivations. So they break down the motivations into six primary, so action, social, mastery, achievement, immersion, and creativity. 
And then there's two uh, secondary motivations for each one. So for example, if you have a high social score, then those players are motivated by playing with other humans. And maybe they have a particularly high community score. They might prefer more cooperative games or games with a robust clan system. And for them, that's a big reason why they even play games. So I went on, I took their survey. Uh, it's a, you know, a self-directed survey. It's a lot like if you've ever taken a Big Five or Ocean personality profile. It's set up in a similar way. Uh, you answer all these questions about your preferences and you give them uh, examples of games you like and so on. And here's my scores. So these are percentiles, basically. It's a percentile rank uh, across the motivations. And that means these are basically how strong your motivations are relative to other gamers. Uh, but one thing I don't really like about how this is displayed is if you look at this, what would you think my most extreme scores are? At a glance, I would probably think, oh, you know, action's pretty high, excitement, you know, challenge and completion are up there. But in truth, my most extreme scores are the ones that are really low. Immersion, creativity, story, power, and strategy. And the reason is that these scores, this is a spectrum. If you have a low score in something, it doesn't mean you lack that thing. It just means that a different end of the spectrum motivates you. So I uh, redid my visualization here uh, like this to show how they fall on a spectrum. So basically, if you're in the middle, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, take it or leave it. I could go one way or the other. The further you are to either end, the stronger your opinion is. If you're 100 action, then if, if that game is not like pumping adrenaline right into your veins, then you're not interested. But if you're zero action, then like any amount of stress in the game and you can't, you're not interested. So very extreme uh, scores. So when I was looking at these scores, I had a hypothesis, which was that the action, mastery, and achievement motivations would probably be most relevant to my love of roguelikes. Um, I'm going to skip talking about social uh, because that's more to do with multiplayer. And I'll go into those low scoring motivations later in the talk, but I'm going to start with these three action, mastery, and achievement and see what we can see. So first up is action with its sub uh, or secondary motivations, excitement and destruction. So I have a slightly high action score which means I like jumping into the fray and being surrounded by drama, but I also appreciate calmer and slower paced games. I just have a slight preference for the more dramatic stuff. My excitement score is pretty high, meaning I like fast paced games, intensity, and have a desire to be surprised. And destruction is pretty in the middle, which means I'm, I'm neutral on chaos. I appreciate a well done explosion, but I can take it or leave it. It's not a huge factor in deciding what games I wanna play. And this all tracks really well with Nuclear Throne, of course, because Nuclear Throne is a high action, twitch thumb still skill game, lots of guns and explosions and screen shake. So this makes sense here. But what about these two? Slay the Spire and Loot Rascals are not action games, they're turn-based games. And, but even though they're not pure action, I found that these games still have qualities that appeal to this action motivation. <clears throat> In particular, these things. Uh, drama, a fast pace, like a fast failure loop, uh, a feeling of intensity, and an opportunity to improvise, to be surprised. For drama, what I mean is, in these games, the stakes are really against you. Lethality is really high. There's no freebies. Any enemy can be dangerous, even the humble maggot. And you often feel overwhelmed and like you have to be on your toes. And that's very satisfying to me. For pacing, I find these games have really fast failure loops, which means the speed at which you get back into the game after a failure is very fast. And slower failure loops make a game less sticky for me. I think this is one of the reasons Enter the Gungeon didn't stick for me. So if you compare the time it takes from when you die to get back into the action, uh, here's Nuclear Throne. And you're in. That's like five seconds, I would say. Uh, Enter the Gungeon, however, is, has a lot longer performance at death. What? 
So not counting counting loading time, that's at least over 10 seconds. And that for me makes the game less sticky. I need I need that fast loop. And this isn't limited to roguelikes for me. Uh, this is why I love games like Celeste, uh, where when I fail, I have just enough time to register what I did wrong, what I could have done differently, and then boom, I'm right back in the action. That's what I mean by a fast failure loop. For intensity, uh, the thing these, these games do well is the intensity of seeing the outcome of your decisions. In Nuclear Throne, this comes through the fact that it's an action game and you're always seeing the results of the decisions you make. But for something like Slay the Spire, this comes through that moment when the enemy intent pops up and I see my hand and I register whether or not I'm in trouble. And in Loot Rascals, it's watching the maths of combat play out and hoping that I made the right gamble engaging with an enemy. A lot of this, again, has to do with performance. Uh, in the original Rogue, which I did not really care for, I think it's because there's not enough intensity for me in watching the outcome of things. So when you're in combat, you have like a text description of what's going on, but you sort of have to like pay attention to your health to really understand like what's happening and how in trouble you are. And it doesn't register as quickly for me. So I think that's why this game bounced for me. And lastly, there's improvisation and a desire to be surprised. This is where the procedural features of roguelikes and the randomness can fulfill this desire, even if there aren't action games. And I basically want to improvise and react to the current situation. So like in Slay the Spire, if I get a relic in the middle of my run that could make me rethink my entire build, that's a satisfying experience for me. So let's add these action motivations to an ongoing list of Lisa's roguelike motivation list. Drama, where the stakes are not in your favor. A fast pace, the failure loops are very fast. An intensity in the performance of seeing the outcome of your decisions. And a desire to be surprised and improvise and react to the situation at hand. So next up is the mastery motivation and its secondary is challenge and strategy. When I read the description of these motivations, I felt like they were very in tune with roguelikes because it's all about challenge and progression, but digging into my own results yielded a couple of surprises. My mastery low motivation is like middle low, which means I prefer being able to be spontaneous in games, but I don't mind some depth and complexity. My challenge score is just slightly above the middle meaning I like a mix in my games of overcoming skill-based learning curves, but also quick to learn, straightforward mechanics. And I have an extremely low strategy score, which means I like reactive gameplay, I like short time horizons and low cognitive load. And these three things in particular are key with the roguelikes I love, reactive decision-making, challenge that serves a purpose and short time horizons. So with reactive decisions, this is my way of looking at how that desire for spontaneity and uh, also the desire for depth of mastery mix together. I prefer roguelikes that give me a small number of meaningful decisions to make on a regular basis. So in Nuclear Throne, this is when I have leveled up, I beat a level, and I get to choose between one of the uh, mutations. In Slay the Spire, it's me choosing my card at the end of combat. And in Loot Rascals, it's choosing and fiddling with the layout of my attack and defense cards every time I get a new drop. This is just enough to make me feel like I'm improvising and reacting to the current situation and making strategic choices without a lot of cognitive load. Games like FTL bounced off of me because they have a much higher cognitive load, and I, I can't keep up with that because my strategy score is so low. So even though these are great games, this is the reason they didn't stick for me. My middling challenge score means I appreciate challenge, but only if it serves my goals. I don't like difficulty for difficulty's sake, but I'm happy to put in the work to master a challenge if it brings me closer to my goal. For example, in Slay the Spire, I had zero interest in doing ascensions. Once I learned you don't get any benefit out of them, they're just harder. I only ever did ascension one because you get more elites, which means you get more helpful relics but I don't feel like I'm missing out by not trying to get to Ascension 20. That just doesn't fulfill my motivations. For short time horizons, 
Uh, this comes from my low strategy score, and it's pretty key in distinguishing between roguelikes that I love and roguelikes that I don't. A short time horizon means I don't have to wait too long to see the results of my decisions, and it means I can understand the end goal easily so I can judge my progress along it. With a lower cognitive load, I basically I don't want to hold too much in my brain at once. Uh, a long time horizon, an example of that would be like 4X grand strategy games like Europa Universalis or the Crusader Kings series, uh, games where your, the results of your decisions take a long time to cook and play out. So if you have a high strategy score, you probably like these games, but I can't, for me, my score is so low, I can't even, I can't even play a 4X game. It's so intense. And the roguelikes I love, the time horizons are ultra short and clearly visible. When you die in Nuclear Throne, you see exactly where you are along the track, how close you got to the throne. Uh, in Slay the Spire, they lay out the tracks very clearly for you, so you know how far you have to get, and you can judge how close you are to the goal. In Loot Rascals, you know, there's, there's five sections, so when you beat one, it's very clear how far you are, how far you have to go. And I use this as a basis for making decisions. Um, I think this is a factor why games like Into the Breach bounced for me. They have slightly longer time horizons. It's not a ton, but in Into the Breach, you do have to think several moves ahead. And even though that's not much longer, again, my strategy score is so low that anything requiring me to hold too much of my brain just bounces for me. All right, so let's add those to our list. I like reactive decision making, meaningful decisions between a small number of choices on a regular basis. I like challenge only if it serves my goals. I don't care for difficulty for difficulty's sake. And I need short time horizons, a low time between making meaningful decisions and seeing the results. Next on our list is the achievement motivation and its secondaries, completion and power. I have a lowish achievement score, meaning I have a pretty relaxed attitude towards in-game achievements. I care about some of them, but not all of them. I like to check boxes, but only the boxes I care about. Meanwhile, I have a higher uh, completion score, which means I'm task-oriented. I love completing tasks and doing quests and stuff like that. My power score surprised me because it's very low. And it surprised me because power is all about progression and getting stronger, like starting weak, getting stronger, which sounds pretty uh, integral to a roguelike. So I was surprised this was so low. Low power scores prefer a flat progression, a level playing field. And the more I thought about it, though, I think it just means that it's my desire for completion that drives me to gain power. I don't get implicit joy just from the act of leveling up. And this tracks with other games too. It reminds me of my World of Warcraft days where when I would hit the level cap, I wouldn't even realize it because I was just so focused on completing quests. Meanwhile, I had a friend who had like calculated the most efficient way to gain XP and was off killing boars or something for like a week straight just to hit the cap. So my motivation wasn't to gain power. It was to complete those tasks. And I think this holds true in roguelikes. So for example, in Loot Rascals, you have these chef quests and getting them give, gives you like more powerful upgrades. But for me, it's like how those upgrades will help me achieve the goal. And just the fact that I love doing quests, that's why I'm motivated to do them. I think these can be summarized in just a high satisfaction with short runs. It's really uh, motivated by those achievement scores. Um, basically, I care about achievement in terms of what the task at hand in, which is the run. And I don't really care about losing power because my power score is really low, which means failure doesn't really sting. Uh, I don't feel like, oh, I was so close to the perfect build and I lost it all. I'm able to redirect my focus to, okay, a new clean slate, a new task to do. And that like motivates me to keep going. And I think for me, this means roguelikes with shorter runs feel better. Uh, even if that means you're dying a lot. Um, I think the game, the story goes on, has a really interesting way of satisfying this motivation for me. In your first run in this game, you don't really die that often. 
but whenever you loop, uh, they take away a bunch of your upgrades you get and a bunch of your stats. You get to keep some of them, but they remove a bunch of them. And this is interesting because it means you get a frequent power reset. It's just not due to death. So let's add that onto the list. Uh, the achievement motivation uh, makes me desire these short and frequent runs. I have a visceral satisfaction with frequent clean slates and new tasks at hand. So now I want to look at my extreme scores. Uh, while I do feel like action, mastery, and achievement definitely are the most aligned with roguelikes, my immersion and creativity scores seem to be big factors in why I prefer some over others. So let's take a closer look, starting with immersion and its two secondary motivations, fantasy and story. So my immersion score is extremely low, which surprised me because I do like narrative games and whatnot. But when it comes to roguelikes, I'm way more grounded in the mechanics of the great game. That's what's driving it for me. For fantasy, I appreciate world building as a rapper, but I'm not looking to lose myself in becoming someone else when I play a roguelike. When I play Slay the Spire, I don't care about the Ironclad as a character. It's just like a placeholder to ground me into the mechanics. And for story, Overarching narrative and characters are not really a factor in if I enjoy a roguelike. And occasionally it can be a distraction. So for example, um, Road Not Taken is an interesting one. Now these scores might make it sound like I hate story and I don't care about characters. But again, this is more to do with what motivates me to keep playing the game. And in Road Not Taken, which is an amazing game, this is a game from Spry Fox. It's basically what if Triple Town were a roguelike, but it has a really strong immersive rapper. The whole game is a metaphor for the creator's struggle with his decision to not have children, and it comes through really strongly in the characters, the quests, the world. And so I felt really emotionally attached to my character and emotionally invested in their motivations. So the problem was that the first time I died, I was done. <laughs> like I never played this game again because it was emotionally traumatizing for me. So this bounced hard for me, but if you have really high immersion scores, you might wanna check this game out because it might really click for you. All right, so narrative for me as a rapper only, I'm way more grounded in the mechanics. Uh, so the last one I'm gonna look at today is creativity with design and discovery. So this is probably my most extreme score. My creativity score is extremely low. And again, this doesn't mean that I'm not creative. It means in the games I enjoy, I don't really have a need to experiment within the game world. I accept the world as it is. I have an extremely low design score. Uh, which means I prefer a curated experience. I don't really care about customization or expressing my individuality through the game. So when I make builds in a roguelike, it's not because I'm trying to express who I am as a person. I'm doing it to achieve my goals. And so it needs to be simple. And then interestingly, I have a low discovery score. This means that I prefer fully exposed rule sets in my games. I want minimum unknown variables. I want to understand the game space so I can learn how to operate within it. And my hypothesis on why all these scores are so low is that I'm a game designer professionally, so I do all this stuff in my job, like every day. I, I do these things for a living. So basically, I don't want these in my games because it makes my games feel like work. At least that's my theory. So to summarize how this manifests in my uh, preferences, I can say that I want exposed rule sets. I want simple practical builds that are not expressive and exploration for me feels like work. My extreme desire for exposed rule sets is probably why games like Slay the Spire and Loot Rascals are so sticky for me. Things like showing enemy intent, the exact health and damage amounts. And in Loot Rascals, they very explicitly explain the maths behind combat. Like randomness is fine as long as it's part of a rule set that I can grok up front. And when I make a build in a roguelike, it's because I'm improvising, reacting to the circumstances, and making choices that are going to help me reach my goal. I'm not really interested in expressing who I am through a build, and I need them to be simple. One of the reasons that I bounced off of Rogue Legacy 
was at the end of a run before you start a new one, you have to make these decisions in this skill tree up front. And it was very distracting for me. And you might be thinking, Lisa, this is not a complicated skill tree. It's got like four layers to it. What's the big deal? But you have to understand that this is an extreme score for me. So anything more that I can hold in my head and I bounce, I need four things to choose from. And I want to see the strategic impact of my decisions immediately. Anything more and I get tired. And lastly, exploration is work to me. I don't want to be bothered discovering the unknown. It's tiring and distracting. It doesn't fulfill me. And I think this is one of the big reasons that I didn't enjoy the original Rogue. Rogue is very heavy on exploration. You get these potions and scrolls. You don't know what they do. You have to figure it out. When you encounter an enemy, you don't really know what it's capable of or what you're up against. You just have to figure it out through the combat. And these are the things that made it bounce really hard for me. But if you have a high discovery score and you've never played the original Rogue, you should give it a try because it might be for you. All right, so I want exposed rule sets. I need to understand the bounds I'm working within. Simple, practical builds, small number of choices, not expressive. And exploration for me is work. I can't be bothered with discovering the unknown. So we did it. We looked at all those scores and dove into my player motivations. And this is how it affects my enjoyment of roguelikes. I like games that have drama, intensity, a fast pace where I have an opportunity to improvise, but within a known rule set that's laid out clearly for me. I prefer making reactive decisions, and I like challenge as long as it serves my goals. My runs need to be short and frequent, and while narrative is great as a rapper, it can't distract me from the mechanics. I need those time horizons to be short. I need to see the impact of my decisions right away. And I have no aversion to starting over with a clean slate. So maybe, you know, if I had had roguelikes explained to me on these terms, I might have like clicked with it a lot easier. Who can say? And so what's the point of all this? Like, don't get me wrong. I would love it if we could start tagging games by the player motivations they serve. But I don't expect that to happen. Player motivation models are nerdy game designer stuff and probably a bit much to expect the general game playing audience to adopt. But what it can do is this self-analysis can help me ask the right questions to figure out if a roguelike is going to click with me or not. So on that note, let's end with an experiment. Let's talk about Hades. I've not played Hades yet. Seems really good. My friends love it. It's got rave reviews. But will it stick with me? Will I play it so much that it becomes a problem? And that's where I will ask you, people who have played Hades, to think about the following questions. How short are the time horizons? How fast is the failure loop? How fast is the time between decisions? Is the story in fantasy a contextual wrapper, or will it get in my way? Does it have intense outcome resolutions? Is exploration low? Are there a minimum amount of unknown variables? And I've set up a survey that you can take. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, and you can give me your analysis of Hades on these fronts. And after I get a good number of responses, I'll play the game and I'll see if the experience lines up with those outcomes. So with that, I want to thank you for coming to my talk. I will have a link to the slides available for people to check these out. You can follow me on Twitter at Wordle if you're interested in the result of the Hades experiment. And if you want to do a self deep dive of your own, please be sure to check out the Gamer Motivation Profile survey on Quantic Foundry's site and look at some of the talks they've given on the topic because it is a fascinating subject. Again, thank you and enjoy the rest of Roguelike Celebration. All right. Fantastic talk, Lisa. We did it. We did yeah. it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know you've been in the chat and see how much people are enjoying it. That final point about Hades is fantastic. Yeah, uh, please heard... do take out that survey. I really want the data. I want to see what it what turns out. Yeah, <laughs> I heard there's romance and you can pet a dog, which is all I need to be sold. <laughs> so taking a look at the speaker questions, the top rated one is actually asking if you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit. Okay, sure. Yeah, um, I'm Lisa. I'm a game designer. Um, I like bird watching and I have a cat. <laughs> what do you want to know? <laughs> Show us the cat. Uh. <laughs> but no, I've been a game designer for over 10 years uh, in all spaces. I've done AAA stuff, indie stuff, academic stuff. 
Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of like deep dive player psychology stuff like this in my work. And I'd always wanted to like, just like dig in and do like a self introspection thing, which I think it'd be great if other people who have really different scores for me could just like do this talk only with their scores. I'd love yeah. to see what comes up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be fantastic. We have like unconferencing sessions. If anyone wants to take an unconference session to discuss their player motivations, yeah. uh, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, another question. So when you took this quiz, were you thinking about the questions in terms of roguelikes only, or were you trying to think about all games that you enjoy? For this specifically, I was thinking about roguelikes because I do feel like different games serve different motivations. And I was really wanting to dig into specifically roguelikes. So for example, like I'm playing Spirit Fair right now and I love mm -hmm. it. And that is definitely like a low action game. Not a lot of, you know, it's very different, very heavier on narrative. So it's just very different motivations it serves. Yeah. So definitely was trying to focus. I think that's one of the flaws of this model is it can be very broad. Um, so I find it helpful to sort of have a game in mind or a set of games in mind when taking it. Yeah, that's very interesting. I've, I've you know, used Quantic Foundry before and, and I never thought about specializing in like that. That's really cool. I know there's a question on the board of, can we take the quiz ourselves? Yes, um, I'll yes. Put a link in the chat. Um, I'll put it again just in case, because I know the chat scrolls fast. Yes. Also, we will try, I think, to, uh, for tomorrow, if nothing else, or at least, like, put that link on a note wall somewhere, like, the at sign. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. We'll, we'll try and stick it up somewhere where people can find it and, um, probably tweet it and some things like that. Cool. But, yes. Uh, another question here. What roguelikes would you say is highly expressive that fulfills the opposite of the practical builds idea? A good question oh, from yeah. Hyper Gardens. I have no idea because I wouldn't have enjoyed it. <laughs> so I wouldn't have played it. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head, but there's got to be, it's got to be out there, right? I feel, be. Like, I feel like the expressiveness and the exploration like tend to like go well together because there's so much of like you digging in. Um, Kawa says things like NetHack might be good for that. Yeah. So, I Maybe. Cut is cut is an interesting point as well to me, mm -hmm. just in that I know that like I replaced my legs with treads, and it wasn't because I thought that was the best build. It's because because I'm gonna have tank legs. Yeah. I can have tank legs. Yeah, so I think that's that's probably a good uh good yeah. Try that hack. <laughs> Always trying to hack. Mm -hmm. um, people do want to see the cat if the cat is available. The cat is asleep right now. I'm sorry, but oh. I, I, I just can like, pull a picture up on my phone and like show it. <laughs> one, one other real question. Not that that's not a real question. Also from Hyper Gardens. Uh, if you've played DCSS, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, how would you rate it for you on the motivation? I have not played it. Okay. I have not. Someone, you tell me. Would I like it? Here's my cat. Oh, oh. oh. Here's my cat. Yay! This is, terrible, this is a terrible way to like show a picture of a cat within a webcam. It's but like, I, I don't know. Like, um, that's sort of why I'm interested in this. Is would I would I like it? I don't know. You tell me. Because <laughs> I haven't played it, and I it, it's always like that. Whenever I start a roguelike, I'm like, oh, this is going to be one of those. Is this going to be one that I'm going to like? It's going to eat my life for the next six months, or is this going to be one that I play and think is interesting and then and move on? Yeah, I never know. DCSS to me is interesting. I'd be curious just in that I think there's a lot of variability where I've sometimes played as like an octopus or a cat because mm -hmm. that's fun, mm -hmm. uh, and the expressiveness, but also I then find it fulfilling. I play a minotaur fighter over and over and over again until I can get that orb. So it's interesting that some games have room inside of it. I feel like you can play DCSS as someone who wants expressiveness and play it as someone who wants... Yeah. Uh, People are saying they suspect I wouldn't I wouldn't like it. So <laughs> they can't like all of them. No, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any um, other any other burning questions? We have like two minutes. Two minutes. Get the questions up there, folks. Yeah. But in the in the meantime, I think what I really want to point out with this talk is like there's nothing wrong with these games because I don't like them. They just don't fit. They don't serve me. And I think we can get lost in that sometimes being like, oh, this is a good game. This is a bad game. Oh, like, you know, you have to play this to understand what these games are all about. But it's there's so many different reasons that people play games that, you know, it's more about the player than the game. And that's why, like, even really great games that I know are well designed and, and critically acclaimed like FTL or Into the Breach, I just... I just don't like them. And that's nothing wrong with the game. It's just they're serving a different 
motivation, which is fine because there's plenty of players with that motivation that need to be served. I think that's a beautiful point. That's a beautiful point to make at the beginning of this roguelike celebration. Yeah. That's, you know, one of the things that's always defined us is that we're not going to get hardcore into, you know, what is a roguelike, what isn't. Like, we're not being exclusive about it because there are so many games that fulfill different niches and, and the roguelike genre can make so many people happy. So wonderful final point. Thank you so much, Lisa. Hopefully Thank you people so can find you in the space as Wordle, I believe, is your yep. username. That's and right. And ask you more questions. So thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye.